Well, now we move on to the mayoral candidates uh, debate. And of course, you are all probably familiar with uh, candidates Michael Bardsley, David Narkowitz, who are with us tonight. And uh, as we did last time, uh, we'll begin with uh, an opening statement. The candidates will have a three minutes uh, for their introduction, uh, two minutes for each question, and we'll alternate them between uh, online questions that we've received through email and, and questions from the audience. And the candidates will have uh, two minutes for their closing statements at the end. Uh, so uh, why don't we begin uh, with Michael Bardsley uh, for your opening statement. I wish to uh, thank the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association for sponsoring tonight's forum. This country is facing some enormous challenges, and therefore our community is facing local variations of these national challenges. The two most serious set of issues are our declining economic health and the various threats to our environment. Every community throughout this nation is grappling in some way with these same problems. I believe that Northampton is uniquely positioned to address these issues in a positive, creative, transformative way. I believe that Northampton has the potential of becoming one of the many role model communities for how to respond to these issues by doing things differently. However, Northampton as a community will not rise to its full potential unless the full range of racial, gender, and economic human diversity is represented and meaningfully involved in the decision making. One significant threat to Northampton's coming together is the fact that increasingly Working middle class individuals and families find our community a difficult place to live. I feel that this is the largest barrier blocking us. We must work our way through these divisive issues before we can successfully resolve our economic and environmental problems. The, uh, the recent Occupy Wall Street movement promises to be one of the most political and social uh, catalysts for change that we have seen in many, many years. Their framework of the 99% and the 1% gives many citizens a new understanding of the issues that they face. Let the 99% and the 1% here in Northampton take this opportunity to understand how these issues of class are being played out here. This is the issue that will most significantly determine what Northampton will look like in the future. And therefore, this is the most significant issue underlying this year's municipal election. Thank you. I also want to begin by thanking the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association for sponsoring tonight's debate and all of you for coming out tonight. Uh, as a former Bridge Street School parent, I've spent a lot of time in this room, and both for spring concerts, plays, teacher appreciation breakfast, bingo nights, and, and, and a couple of graduations. Our schools are a place for community, so it's fitting that we gather here tonight to talk about our city government, because at the end of the day, city government really is about community. Ordinary residents like you and me coming together as neighbors, appointees, or elected officials and working together to solve problems and chart a positive course for the city that we all love. I was born and raised in Western Mass in a large working class family of nine kids. My parents taught me the value of hard work and instilled a strong ethic of community involvement and service. I enlisted in the Air Force after high school and served on active duty and as a member of the Massachusetts Air National Guard. In addition to lifelong lessons about service, discipline, and leadership, my six years in the military gave me valuable training as a personnel specialist and real-world experience managing people, data, and resources in a large, diverse organization. I put myself through the University of Massachusetts at Amherst using my veterans' benefits and by holding as many as three part-time jobs a semester together with summer jobs. I graduated Phi Beta Kappa with a BA in political science and received several academic and leadership awards. 
After college, I worked seven years as a staff member for the U.S. House of Representatives. This included time in Washington, D.C. as a legislative assistant, advising members of Congress on a broad range of policy and budget issues. It also included serving as Congressman John Olver's District Economic Development Director, working to bring federal support to communities across western Massachusetts, and leading a staff based in three offices throughout the district. The best groundwork for the position of mayor, however, might have been my next job, stay-at-home dad. When we started our family, I stayed home with our children so my wife could finish her medical training and begin her successful career. It was the most challenging and rewarding job I've had, and while my focus was on my family, it allowed me to immerse myself in the neighborhood and my community with organizations like the Northampton Education Foundation or volunteering here at Bridge Street School serving on city boards, including the Zoning Board of Appeals and the Transportation and Parking Commission. In 2005, my neighbors in Ward 4 elected me their representative to the city council. In 2009, the city elected me its councilor at large, and my colleagues elected me city council president. I've worked with people across Northampton on issues including transportation, energy, education, economic development, the budget, and government reform. I've created policies and programs aimed at keeping our community strong. I've also learned the nuts and bolts of how our city functions and an understanding and appreciation of the challenges we face as a community. My experience at the federal, state, and local level, combined with my record of community volunteerism and city council service, has uniquely prepared me to lead Northampton. I am the candidate with a positive vision and the proven record of leadership and results who can move our great city forward. Thank you. We'll move on now to the first round of questions. This is a question that we asked the uh, city council at large candidates, and we'll rotate the responses uh, between the candidates, uh, starting with Michael Bardsley, actually the first one. The first question is, how would you solve the traffic, parking, and drainage issues that must be addressed as part of the Fairgrounds Redevelopment Program? Well, I will uh, I approach that as a process question. Um, the first and foremost, it needs to involve the, uh, the citizens and especially those who are uh, abutting um, the area. Um, there has been uh, problems with uh, communication around the specific plans. I know there's a, uh, a lawsuit going on now. There are uh, requests for information from minutes from meetings in which um, the aspects of the decision was uh, discussed and people want the information from those minutes and they, they haven't been provided. Um, so the, it's really a, uh, it, it's larger than the decisions being made on the fairground. It's how the city makes the decision, how the city interacts with its citizens about decisions that are impacting them. And we need to have decisions that are made on their merits. We need to be very transparent in the information we provide. And we need to hopefully decrease um, the uh, number of instances where people feel like they have to resort to suing the city in order to get the information they need on a particular issue. And that's something that has happened all too frequently in the past. So first and foremost, we need transparency, open meetings, open information. Um, the other thing that we need to look at, and this is a, an example of the uh, public-private partnerships, and it's the role of city uh, officials in these uh, private uh, uh, partnerships, and whether or not they are agents of the city and whether or not they're uh, independent agents. I believe they're agents of the city. And then we need protocols in place for um, how the uh, roles of these folks um, are when they are representing the city on a private entity. <clears throat> yeah, the, the, um, obviously the Three County Fairgrounds is uh, one of the oldest, longest running agricultural fairs in the country. It's, a, it's a, been a long part of Northampton in our agricultural history. Um, and it's, it, it has the potential to expand and to be able to continue uh, serving that purpose uh, into the future. But obviously the redevelopment piece of it is very important because it impacts the neighborhoods that live nearby. Um, so I do think the issues of traffic, of parking, and drainage are key ones. And this whole issue of public versus private, of you know, public, the city's role versus the pro 
private board is actually something I've been working on in the last couple of weeks because it's a situation that I've inherited as acting mayor and I've been trying to figure out a solution to it. Um, and, and, and the solution is a balancing act because it's critical, I think, that we have the neighborhood and we have um, uh, the city represented at the table. Uh, this is a private redevelopment board that's working on the project and I think it's important that we have uh, citizen voices at the table being part of these decisions which will impact these issues of traffic, of parking, of drainage. Um, so I've been trying to craft sort of a solution where uh, we can, I, I'm withdrawing the city's um, appointed or staff from the board uh, and I'm trying to figure out a way to create either ex officio roles but definitely to make sure that we have citizen representation on that process so that they have input into the decision making and then to really encourage uh, the fairground uh, to make sure that when they that they work now on phase one the new barns have been completed as they move forward with phase two to really make sure that they have an open process and that the neighborhood is involved and that they're um, vetting the plans with the neighborhood to get the feedback that's required because you know the people that I talk to that live around the fairgrounds generally are supportive of the fair they think the fair is an important part of the city, but they just want to make sure that, that they're part of the process and that the plans and decisions that are made there uh, don't adversely affect the neighborhood. And I think that's the key piece this, uh, that we need to be working on. And that's the role that I'll try to play as mayor in the process. Questions from the audience? Yes, this gentleman right here. Okay, so both candidates on stage have often talked about how they take many unpopular positions. Um, can you both tell me if you have taken any popular positions? And uh, if so, what were they and why would you take them if they're so popular? <laughs> okay. Well, um, I mean, I, I think that, um, you know, as a decision maker, as, a, as an elected official, you're, you know, you're having to make lots of different decisions. And obviously, you know, some are more popular than others. I think part of, um, part of the role of a leader is to be a consensus builder, to try to build consensus around big decisions, around things. So, you know, I take, for example, um, the issue of the police station. Uh, which was an, an issue that I was involved in. I've served on the on the planning committee, the site planning committee. Um, that was a difficult issue because there was a definite need for having a police station in the city. Um, I think most people in the city, uh, you know, like our police department, want to make sure that they have a good headquarters. Um, but it required the fact it required us to go out and to really um, talk to people about the issue and give them the facts and give them the information about why it was important for them to support a debt exclusion so that we'd have the capacity to borrow the money to do it. Um, so that turned out to be a very popular uh, position, but it was really because I think we did a lot of work to make sure that people had the information that they needed, that it was the correct decision, that it was something that was going to be beneficial to the community. Um, and so, you know, I, that's an example of a, I think, was a popular decision, I suppose, in hindsight. But it took a lot of work because you know we need, we have an obligation to give people all the facts uh, to try to build consensus around issues um, so that you know we can have support for them. I can think of a uh, a, a series of issues that I'm I led uh, on the city council. First one that comes to mind is the uh, the formation of the Human and Civil Rights uh, Commission. Um, that was something that people hadn't considered. Um, I did the, uh, the groundwork and put forward uh, the proposal and it gathered a lot of support and it was a un unanimous vote. Um, <clears throat> uh, another one would be uh, leading the uh, override effort for the high school renovation. Um, I was the co-chair of that. I was also very active on the override for the uh, uh, middle school. And both of those initially were very controversial um, through a, an aggressive educational uh, campaign and doing a lot of outreach. They became very uh, popular. Um, the high school vote at the time, and it may still stand, but it, I think it was the highest percentage of, uh, of an override passing um, in support of that project. Um, uh, another one that was uh, popular with some and unpopular with others was putting uh, the referendum for uh, the landfill on the, uh, the ballot. Um, 
myself and Council Mary Ann Labarge brought that forward to the City Council to put on the ballot. The City Council uh, declined to uh, take the leadership on that, and then it fell to, uh, to citizens to put it on the ballot. It was very controversial, a lot of discussions, but it ended up passing in every single precinct in the city. So that's something where I provided the leadership along with the key, uh, some key other folks and putting that forward and the, and the support was there. The next question is from an online uh, submission. Several years ago, when you were both on the city council, there was a controversy about the creation of the Northampton Business Improvement District. Can you tell us, please, what your position was then, whether you believe the BID has been effective, and if your position on it has changed? Michael. The, uh, the bid had actually two votes. There was one vote to allow the businesses to go forward and create such a, uh, an association. And then there was a, a vote on the contract or the memorandum of understanding with the city. I voted yes to allow them uh, to do it. I voted no on the memorandum of understanding. And one of my concerns with the memorandum of understanding is that there were a number of provisions in there that the city should have been doing anyways. And I did not think it was proper to have that as a form of a contract. Um, I have met with the, uh, the bid board of directors uh, within the last 10 days, two weeks. Um, they presented a series of uh, questions they were asking each of us. I looked at the questions and I said, maybe I'm reading too much in this, but I see in these questions an awful lot of frustration and discontent with dealing with the city. And they said, well, you're right. Um, we, we even cleaned up the questions. And, um, they made the comment that having those provision, uh, provisions in writing in a contract didn't change the, uh, the city's behavior at all. Uh, there are concerns about uh, snow removal and street repair and sidewalk repair downtown. They are spending their own money doing things the city is supposed to be doing. And I said, well, that's exactly why I voted against the contract because it's not the contract, it's the leadership. And we need leadership that will do it. I do think there's a number of areas where the bid has made a significant improvement in terms of uh, cleanliness, safety, um, the, uh, in, in some areas safety, and the, um, the around the holidays and around some other uh, uh, events. So they have definitely moved downtown uh, forward, but they, I, I'm really concerned about the relationship with the city. Yes, uh, I, uh, I, during the uh, deliberations on the bid, I supported the legislation to create the bid. Uh, and uh, I believed at the time that it was, you know, this is something that's been done around the country. And essentially the concept is it's a group of property owners, primarily business owners, that are saying to a community, we're willing to pay more in taxes to raise our own taxes effectively, to have some additional funding to be able to pay for shared services, to be able to pay for improvements in the district in which they're located. So, you know, uh, I thought that was great, and I think it was a, it's a great concept. It's been very successful in other parts of the country. As part of that, um, and a lot of the language that was in what's called the Memorandum of Understanding is also part of the bid language. Um, they work with nonprofits, so uh, Smith and other nonprofits, to sign these Memorandums of Understanding. And it talks about a baseline of services that the city needs to provide. It also spells out some financial contributions that the city would make as a bid member. Um, and I supported adopting that. It's, uh, these were the similar agreements that other landowners were being asked to sign. Uh, the city's one of the largest landers and landowners downtown, um, so I supported both of those. It was part of uh, the standard passage of a bid in Massachusetts. I also met with the bid board, and I know that they have had some frustrations around the city's relationship, and I've actually done some work on that relationship as, as council president. There were some issues around snow plowing, and there were some issues around billing and some issues like that that I've tried to help them with and facilitate, so I understand many of those issues. I also met with the bid board and had a really good conversation with them. Um, and I think that they've done a lot of good work in the, in, the, in the amount of time that they've gotten going. They've been doing the downtown cleanliness, which I think a lot of people appreciate. 
Uh, we, we kind of had been spoiled because we had the honor court doing it. And then when the honor court went away, it was a noticeable void. So the bid has allowed them to pick that up. They've been, as you saw the holiday lighting trucks out, they're getting ready with the lighting. They've been doing painting. They've been doing brick improvements. So I think it's been a great thing. I do think it's important for the next mayor uh, to have a good relationship with them to make sure that those city services that are part of our baseline are being upheld. Question from the audience. Someone on this side? Yes. Hi. Um, on the previous uh, counselors, this question came up in one form, and I, it's uh, concerning the route, uh, route 5 King Street corridor. I've been reading a lot of articles about it, but it was referred to is the zoning that's could you please explain the zoning um, proposal for this? I guess there's something there. And what would you like to see yourself on the, especially in the wasteland parking lots and areas um, that back up onto the railroad tracks and along King Street? Okay, so, um, okay, it's gonna take a while to explain this, but okay. Uh, so in 2002, the city enacted zo new zoning for King Street, which uh, was attempting to try to create some, some uh, new setbacks or, and some principles where we were trying to encourage building up to the street, et cetera. So the new proposal that actually just, we just uh, closed our public hearing last night at the Ordinance Committee, uh, tries to revise that by not taking a monolithic approach to King Street, but by breaking it up into three distinct areas. Uh, closer to downtown, extending the central business uh, district, um, and then a gateway business, uh, entranceway business in the middle, which is kind of a segue, and then a more traditional highway business commercial area in the traditional northern part of King Street. And the goal is to try to both um, increase the number of uses that are available, as well as relax the setback standards that have been put in place to give people more flexibility about where they want to site their buildings, what kind of siting they want to do, while also maintaining some really good provisions around design, around pedestrian access, around uh, bike access. Um, so trying to do the best of both worlds, but really trying to increase um, the, the availability and the, and, the, and the availability of uses and the flexibility on the lot. Because I think one of the concerns that came out of the previous zoning was that it may have been inhibited um, people wanting to locate there because of uh, the fact that it was not as flexible. Now, there have been a number of other issues at play, you know, recessions, there have been issues, some of the sites have had some environmental issues. Uh, there was another site that was being held by a landowner for quite a long time and um, was receiving, uh, you know, a 99-year lease from a grocery store chain. So there are a lot of individual stories about the individual parcels, but I think the consensus now, and there's been a lot of process around this, the, the uh, Zoning Revisions Committee looked at it, the Chamber looked at it, is that the zoning really needed to be revisited, and it wasn't a one-size-fit-all approach. We needed to kind of break it up and recognize the three distinct areas of King Street and try to make the zoning reflect that. And hopefully, it's going to create some more opportunities. And I'm really excited about the mixed use opportunities because, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be just retail. We might have some other office uses like commercial, et cetera. When the uh, previous council uh, adopted the, uh, the zoning changes that we're now changing again, um, they were seen as being innovative and trying a new idea with, with zoning and would. Um, affect how the uh, the businesses were situated in terms of the relationship to the frontage of the uh, uh, King Street. And it sounded like a good idea at the time. Um, there was a push from the, uh, the planning department and several of the councilors, so we tried it. And then um, since that lot hadn't been developed in that period of time, then it was sort of deemed that they, it wasn't working, uh, and now another set of changes are being uh, proposed. One of my concerns is one of the things that the city doesn't do in a very thorough way is sort of evaluate its decisions, and if a decision is not successful or doesn't meet the goals that we had for it, it's re really determined why. Was it because it was inappropriate uh, zoning? Did we make a mistake? Uh, a uh, number of years ago, five or seven years ago, um, was it d 
due just to the unfortunate circumstances of the uh, economy? Uh, did the city not try hard enough in its economic development to go out and do the outreach to those specific type of businesses that we come here? That's the type of thing, and when I was a, an educator in the schools, we were constantly evaluating curriculum programs to determine why things were or were not successful. And the city doesn't really have a, a, a good practice in doing that. Um, we were asked the same question about what we would like to see there at, uh, when we were talking in front of the uh, Lathrop community, uh, and there was about 60 or 70 seniors in the room. And my response was, well, I probably had a preference to seeing the light industry up there for jobs or uh, the transportation center that would be a great place for the, a transportation center to go. And afterwards, I was challenged in my responses because the seniors told me, a number of them, that they don't have a place to go shopping. They, they're not going to go downtown. It doesn't meet their needs. Uh, Walmart is limited. So they all drive out of town, uh, either into Hadley or Holyoke. So I think one of the things we need to do is do a, a needs assessment to see what is the demand of, of the citizens and is there a, a demand for some of that uh, shopping there or is there more of a demand? It, it makes more sense to have light industry which have higher paying jobs than usually retail. So I, I think we really need to have that discussion and consider the various needs of, uh, of the c citizenry when we're uh, pushing forward another set of changes. I had to explain. <laughs> Here's a, another King Street related question. The city of Northampton has created a network of paths and rail trails which allow people to make their way into the center of town to do business, get to school, run errands. Last year, the rail trail between King Street and downtown, uh, Taco Bell rather, and downtown wasn't plowed, which forced many pedestrians and bikers who use that path to go onto streets and sidewalks along King Street that were full of snow and ice. As mayor, how would you prioritize plowing of this section of the trail? Well, the plowing of the rail trails is, is one of those uh, issues that really strikes a, uh, a chord with a lot of citizens because there are a lot of citizens who are very uh, uh, displeased with the job the city does in plowing the roads. And there are a number of neighborhoods, and matter of fact, there's, there's a neighborhood uh, right here in this ward, and pr there's probably more than one of them, where there's, uh, after two or three storms in a row, the streets can get uh, very, very tight and very jammed up. And I know that because I, um, I live here on, on Union Street, as a matter of fact. Um, so there's a lot of folks who are concerned with the job that the city does. There's a limited number of, of dollars. So uh, right now, with the way the system is, my priority would be keeping the road safe and passable for uh, citizens. If there's a way to streamline that and save some money, then, then we could do that. We also need to look at uh, the possibility of uh, uh, bringing in additional income to see if we could... Uh, um, use that on I infrastructure because we are facing huge problems coming down the pike, not just with uh, the plowing and keeping the roads and the bikeways in a good condition. And one of the ideas that I will push forward, and again, it's volunteer and it would be a community discussion, but is looking at the, uh, the, the property that is owned by the nonprofits of which there are legally no taxes paid and to see, uh, following the, the model in Boston, to see if we could get some voluntary payment up to 10% on the, uh, the taxes um, of that uh, tax exempt property. And if we could do that, if we got 10% of the value, that would mean um, over a million dollars based on my discussion with the assessor's office in revenues to the city each year. So. Yeah, the um, the issue of the of the bike trails has uh, been a perennial one. We've had a we have a great bike trail network. We have a lot of people that do use them year round, especially schools, uh, school children uh, who use it as a primary access to get to school every day. 
Um, the city has tried to incrementally um, figure out ways to, to plow. Obviously, our, our DPW crews, their first priority is, is getting the streets done, and they oftentimes, after a two, one or two day storm event, are sleeping. And, uh, and so one of the things we've tried to do is work with some of our other departments, like the parking department downtown, for example, does plow the downtown section of the trail. And last year was only able to get up to the bike bridge. Uh, and so that section to Taco Bell uh, did not get plowed. Um, and so we've been looking at, uh, we're actually been having the city snow preparation meeting. And we've heard from a lot of people that they'd like to do that. And so one of the ideas that I'm working on around that is to figure out how much it would cost, just get a cost estimate for it. Because I know there's a number of groups like the Friends of Northampton Trails and Greenways that has talked about they might be willing to, to help do some fundraising around it to try to help us uh, supplement that because there are there is a constituency for doing that. So there might be a possibility for a public-private partnership uh, to support plowing that extra section of the, of the trail, which I think would be great. Um, so I'm working on trying to get some cost analysis. I know uh, Ward 3 City Councilor Owen Freeman Daniels, this is an issue that he's concerned about. Um, and so I'm trying to get some information about that so that maybe we can figure out a way to do more and to do something creative with a, with a public-private partnership. Question from the audience? Yes, the gentleman here, Joel. Hi, I'm from Ward 3, but I'm going to ask a more general question. And First thing I'd like to say is I think Northampton is a fabulous city. I lived for years in Paris. I lived in a suburban town of Paris and uh, called So, about 10 miles away on the bike trail from Paris. And by being here, it's like being in So. So the quality of life in this town is extremely good. The city is great. The education is great. The people are interesting, whether the 1% or the other. OK, I'll, okay, I'll make my question. The question, is, the question is very simple. It's that what we need are jobs and we need are revenues, jobs and revenues. How, what are the specifics, both in the region and in the city, that we can move quickly in the first in the two years of your mayorship to make things happen so there are more jobs and there's more revenue for the city. What is your plan? Well, the first part of my plan is to, is to, get, is to have a plan, is to make a plan. I think one of the things we haven't done very well is, is, uh, is sort of be proactive in our planning efforts around economic development. We've, I think we've tried to be reactive. We've tried to, uh, to work on certain areas. I've proposed putting together an economic development advisory commission. Uh, we've done great work in transportation and energy uh, using these, this commission approach where we bring in experts, private, public, to try to solve problems. So that would be one thing I would do. I also think one of the key pieces of this is really looking at our budget process to try to figure out how can we make, how can we create more revenues within the existing budget that we have in terms of, uh, of looking at efficiencies in the way city government operates. In terms of the, the, the jobs piece, though, I think the mayor also has to be very active, not just in the city in terms of reaching out to local businesses, uh, reaching out to potential businesses that want to locate in the city, um, having a marketing program for the city, um, but also looking at the region as a whole. Uh, because uh, what thing, there's a lot of regional opportunities as well. We have the University of Massachusetts, which is our largest employer of Northampton residents. I think there's a lot of potential there in terms of how can we um, leverage the stuff that the university is doing in the sciences and biotechnology. Are there opportunities to try to, to create jobs here in Northampton based on that? I think the knowledge corridor, which uh, will be bringing rail back to, to Northampton soon, I think that has a great potential for opening up regional connections up and down the Connecticut at River Valley, uh, that we can try to, to create that. I think the new supercomputing center in Holyoke, um, you know, we have a great amount of folks here who are in the high tech field. We have a highly educated workforce. I think that's going to start to be a magnet for the kinds of things that I think North would play to Northampton's strengths. We're also a green community. We're, there's a, a strong ethic of sustainability. I think that's a great uh, sector that we should be looking at, the green collar jobs. We, we've been a leader in terms of the adopting the stretch energy code, and there's a whole lot of businesses that have grown up in Northampton in this green collar industry, you know, home performance, home energy performance. I think those are a lot of the things we need to focus on in the immediate term to create jobs and to create economic opportunity. 
the uh, economic development program that we ha currently have has uh, very little focus to it. If you look at the city's budget and you look through there, you can't really figure out what the, uh, the main focus, what the, even the main activity of that department is. It's a recently created department, it's a department head and two employees, and it has a wide range of uh, responsibilities. So we need to have a very, very focused economic development plan. Um, some of the, uh, the pieces of it that I would uh, push, and I think some of these can be implemented immediately, one is going around and supporting our current local businesses. Our local businesses do not feel supported. I have spent two days walking around downtown Northampton. I haven't uh, finished it. I probably have another day and a half to go. I spent a day walking around downtown Florence, and the theme is very similar. They do, um, local businesses do not feel supported by the local government here. Um, many of the long-term businesses, a couple of them, uh, 16 years in business downtown, they had never seen the mayor in their store. They had never seen the economic development coordinator in their store. That's a problem. So we need a mayor who will be a champion of our local businesses and will support them or will go out and do the outreach. Um, I will also uh, spearhead a hiring local uh, program. We have a lot of jobs where we go out and we hire outside of the community for, for that. And that's, I think, unnecessary. We're losing jobs. There are a lot of opportunities that are around green businesses. And there's also opportunities here around cooperative or worker-owned businesses, which I think is a fantastic fit for this community. Um, UMass has a program that specializes and has assistance there. We have never tapped into that. I've been to workshops. I don't see city officials there. Um, oh, oh. Thank you. Here's another economic development related question. How do you feel the situation with the proposed hotel at Pulaski Park was handled and how will you handle a situation like this in the future? Pulaski Park was a, uh, a potentially a, a good idea that um, kind of fell apart for a couple of different reasons. Um, there was some uh, discussion on the hotel and, oh, actually it wasn't, the initial discussion was just a, a business in general. It wasn't specifically around a hotel. Um, that discussion happened in finance committee. Um, there were some of us on finance who did see that the uh, a hotel had an advantage, um, and uh, one of the ideas that was discussed was creating a, uh, a, if we could attract a hotel that would be a working partner with the Academy of Music, and that discussion happened at the time before anybody knew the Academy was in um, economic trouble, um, but if the, it could be a corporate sponsor with the Academy, a good working relationship there, there was an opportunity to move in uh, perhaps the Center for the Arts who were looking for a new home at the time to the um, uh, to Memorial Hall and create a little art enclave there and have an art park. Boston accent, you can hear. Um, so that's what we were, were kicked around as an idea. That idea was never reflected in the further discussions as it moved out of the Finance Committee and, uh, and the RFP. It was the, uh, the Economic um, Development Committee was charged with working with the mayor to develop a, an RFP. Um, and I think that was the problem because the RFP was, it was a blank slate and it was going uh, encourage the, the biggest bang for the buck. So we got a, a hotel proposal in there that would have generated the most revenue for the city but wasn't necessarily a good fit. So I think we, when we start that again, we need to have a process where the citizens are involved in it from the very beginning. Um, and that we crea cr craft an RFP that reflects the, uh, the desires and the goals of the citizens and something that will be a good fit for downtown. Yes, yeah, so um, uh, the won't go back over that history. The the um, you know I think the hotel project is an example of something where if we can go back in time and think about it again, the idea would be um, try to uh, start with what the start with what you want 
the final product to look like, try to get ideas about what we want to see as the final goal for that project. Um, I've, I've said the idea of, you know, putting a big sign out there, ideas wanted, not for sale or not, you know, developer wanted, but ideas wanted. Let's hear some ideas from the community about what they want for that space. Let's hear from some developers out there about some ideas that they might have for creative ways to redevelop it. So that would be the approach if we are able to now move away from where we are now, which is in a legal matter. Um, and I would want to sort of start that conversation again and really try to get ideas about what the best uses for that space are. Um, try to talk to design professionals, try to talk to the community, try to get those ideas, and then craft an RFP based on that. I will say that the, 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 you know, the city council owned that property, controlled that property, and in 2005 uh, uh, essentially just voted to give the control of it to the mayor um, and sort of lost its opportunity, I thought, to be able to put some parameters around that decision and to try to put some parameters around the process. Um, so I think having the involvement of the city council and the mayor in that process would be really important. Um, but again, I think the key is trying to figure out what would be the best use for that uh, property, what would fit in with the downtown, what would fit in with the character of our city, um, and also what would generate you know, revenue, because that isn't a key piece of what we want to do with that key piece of property, is create jobs, create economic opportunity, uh, but also have something that's sensitive to, uh, to the downtown and fits in with the character of the downtown. Question from the audience? Yes, in the back. This speaks to jobs and ec economic um, priorities. Um, the current uh, police department or uh, police station being built is being it has uh, concrete coming from outside the area. What would you do in a, a future project to ensure that local businesses are used? Yeah. Okay. So um, I can say about the police station project, they, they, um, because it's a, a government-funded project, we have to use the bidding procedures, state bidding procedures. We are not allowed to say only local companies can bid on a project. We do have to put out, uh, you know, open it up to the public. Uh, we do have to try to make sure that we, um, you know, obviously find the best qualified bidder, but in terms of uh, putting a restriction it can only be a local company that doesn't necessarily that's not necessarily legal but i know that in this process we also worked very closely with uh, local labor unions to make sure that they were part of the process they sat down together with the general contractor uh, to, to look at some of the bid specifications to make sure that the local trades here would have a fair uh, chance at getting some of those bids and and in fact on the subcontracting level, because that's where a lot of the work happens. You know, you've got the big GCs and you've got some of the big, uh, you know, the steel erectors and the concrete folks, but it's at the sub level where a lot of those uh, key labor jobs are. And so there was a lot of work with the building trades to make sure that uh, those subcontractors, that the local um, uh, unions had a, had a seat at the table and were able to bid fairly on those. So, you know, we, we're using um, Bar and Bar, which is a local Springfield based company. Uh, which is, uh, you know, they've done the Cooley Dickinson project. They've done so. They're they're a local company. Bill Quadro, born and raised in Northampton, I think, who's the project manager, and uh, and so that's that's sort of how that plays out. Um, we can't say only local because we have to have an open and fair bidding process, uh, and people have to have an opportunity to bid on it. But obviously, you know, we'd love to try to qualify and make sure that we have a lot of local people apply because we have a lot of, you know, quality construction firms um, that 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 have built some great buildings here in the city. D. A. Sullivan, uh, you know, built a lot of great buildings here in the city. So, you know, we want to try to encourage them to participate in our bidding process. There's a uh, uh, also a distinction between a local business and then a business that's hiring local. And you can have a business from out of the area that could come in and hire local. And the, uh, the, the local labor unions are very critical of Northampton specifically because they do not do the uh, sort of the uh, aggressive measures that would ensure that a number of um, people would be hired locally. 
they have approached the uh, the city in the past, and the city has told them they're not interested in any type of um, higher local uh, programs. And I would definitely change that. I will work with the local unions. I will work with the local businesses. We can put provisions in our, uh, our bidding process for having up to a certain number of folks um, being local for for the jobs and for the hiring, even if the firm is from out of the, of the out of the city. So, and that's one of the areas where we can um, create jobs and have it so working people and and in this case the trades folks can afford to stay in Northampton or stay in the area. This next question. How would you characterize the balance of power between the city council and the mayor? Do you think the current balance of power has served the city well? Well, I will use as uh, my context the balance of power and the, uh, the last several years of the, uh, the previous administration. And um, it, uh, from my uh, experience, it got very much out of balance. I think there was an imbalance, and um, I think one of the key reasons for that was uh, the lack of term limits. I think we desperately need term limits, uh, especially in the uh, executive office, um, paralleling the, uh, the president. Um, we have uh, term limits. There's uh, two four-year terms. I don't know if that's the magic formula for the mayor's office, but I would see, I don't think a, a mayor should be in there for more than uh, eight years. Um, and what happens is because of the nature of the, the city council being basically uh, part-time volunteer positions, um, and because of the nature of uh, the dynamics with the department heads, a, a mayor who has been in there a long time has an awful lot of power and influence and a lot of times can push a, a, a decision through um, without there being a, an, an appropriate amount of vetting in terms of the issues. And if you looked at some of the discussions in the last year, um, they haven't been, uh, uh, they appear that the decisions haven't really been made on the merits of the issue. There's always something else going on. In terms, of a perfect example is the, uh, the, the educational overlay district where the citizens weren't represented and because uh, uh, their counselor recused himself, I was pulled in to represent them. I brought up some issues. And when we were discussing it at the, at the council, one of my colleagues made the comment, the more we discuss this, the more confused I get. Let's just vote on it and get it over with. And that's that type of uh, thinking at, at the council level shows the decision was made and other than the merits of the decision. Uh, I think the you know the system that we have now is that the the mayor proposes budgets, uh, some legislation, et cetera, but the city council is the fi has the final say. No spending happens, no appointments happen, no anything happens really without the city council approving it as a legislative body. Um, I, I do think uh, some of the issues that are being described by my opponent, I think a lot of that comes down to the leadership of the council during that period. Um, because I do think that uh, it requires strong leadership of the legislative branch. I've been city council president. I've very clearly asserted the leadership of the city council, of the legislative branch. I've made sure that I am in on all big decisions. I've taken an active role in putting together the agenda for the council, for setting the agenda for the council. Uh, and and we, I think we've avoided many of the controversies that occurred over those past years because of really a lack of leadership from the city council. Um, kind of a passive-aggressive approach. So I think that there can be issues around the balance of power. Um, it requires a strong legislative branch. It requires a strong mayor. As mayor, I'm going to try to work with the city council. I'm going to try to give them the information that they need. I'm going to try to bring forward proposals uh, that have a lot of information so that they can vet them thoroughly and, and talk with their constituents about them. Um, you know, the idea of term limits, it's great. We're having a charter review committee that can look at it. Um, you know, it is always interesting when a 16-year incumbent proposes term limits. Um, and also, you know, there was a measure that came forward to set term limits for the city council president when we were both on it, um, and we both voted against term limits for the city council president. Um, I believe that uh, I believe that you know we have elections in this country, and those are a term; they're a natural term limit. Every two years here in Northampton, we have an election. So. 
Um, so, you know, we can look at that issue as part of the charter review that's happening right now, uh, but I think the key thing in the balance of power is having a strong legislative branch, and I think we have some great city councilors now, um, and I feel like we've had a really effective council this term, and I've been happy to be part of leading that council because we've been very engaged and we've been very involved in the issues, and we've asserted ourselves in the process. Question from the floor. Yes. Hi. Um, I wanted to, somebody before mentioned that we have a great city, which I agree with, but he also said we had a great education system, which I don't really agree with. I went to this school, I love this school, but I also had issues with the school start time in the high school. I took Spanish at 7.30 in the morning, which speaking English is hard at that time, so pretty ridiculous. Um, so I want to know what your stance is on school start time. I also want to know what you have ideas for innovative education, because to be honest, the going through the school system, which I eventually left, uh, was really boring. And uh, testing kids over and over again is not really going to help them learn. Uh, I know the school start time is a, has been a big issue. We've had a community group to, and a committee that's been studying this issue. There's a lot of research out there about you know, when kids wake up in the morning and, and, the, and how prepared they are to learn at different times of the day. I know the school committee did a whole process around this um, to look at it. were there ways that they could readjust the bus schedules. We have a three-tiered bus schedule that was created many years ago as a, as a cost savings so that the same bus is bringing the kids to the elementary school, the middle school, and the high school. So uh, to try to untier that required a, a significant amount of money when they looked at it the last time. Um, and of course we were having some financial difficulties. But I know that there's still an active group that's working on it. I know that the new superintendent and the school committee, which I've been a member of the school committee now for a few weeks, they are going to take up this issue again and try to figure out if there's a way that they can make it work. Um, I mean, the concerns about it are we also want to provide transportation to people uh, and, and we want to do it in a way that's safe. We also have obligations for special ed transportation. So that's, there's a lot of different issues involved with it. Um, but I think the research shows that there could be some value to it, so we should pursue it. Um, you know, in terms of the schools, I think, you know, we have, my kids have also been, went to this school, they're at JFK right now. Um, and there is a lot of concern, including among teachers and among parents, about sort of the testing mentality that we have. And it's really, it's actually, we had a whole briefing on MCAS the other night, and all the little quartiles, and all the, and it's, a, it's an odd paradox that, Massachusetts, which has the highest number of college graduates, um, and Northampton, which, you know, you read the paper and 99% of the kids who graduate are going to college, yet under the frameworks that have been created around MCAS, we're seen as an underperforming school. And I think that puts pressure on students, it puts pressure on teachers, and it gets away from the real elements of learning. So I'm excited that there's going to be an opportunity for schools to do waivers from that restraining system and be able to really focus on the, the real core issue is, is learning, student instruction, teaching, how we have the best schools and create the best results. Um, and that's the sort of stuff that I want to see happening in the school, not being bound by tests. I think the uh, probably the most significant uh, piece in the, the whole picture of L, uh, education are the teachers. And the teachers need to feel supported, they need to feel appreciated, they need to feel that they're uh, honored and respected. And I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done in Northampton. I think over the last several years, the, the treatment of the teachers and the teachers' union have been very demoralizing. And I'm not saying that the outcome could have been any differently in terms of the, the money piece, but in, certainly in terms of how they were handled in, in public and uh, the remarks that were made about them and the way that the union, the union was dealt with, um, that was uh, 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 very unfortunate. So um, I think that there is, uh, that, that's the first piece that I would start with is the, the morale of teachers. Um, in terms of the, uh, the transportation part, I have uh, a call and spoken with the, one of the parents who is pushing, looking at the change of time. I came from a school district that had two tiers. We had one uh, bus doing the middle school and the high school. It worked very effectively. Um, I would have to look at the numbers and what the changes were made, but I heard there's only something like 140 high school students taking uh, the buses on the high school tier. And I don't know if that, that doesn't sound cost effective to me, so I would uh, do the, the work to look at uh, those numbers to see if we, that could be a, 
uh, a consol consolidation to two tiers. The, in, uh, in education, one size does not fit all. We need to have different options in, in different programs. When I was in the Yammer schools, I, I um, formed a number of different programs. Some of them were uh, work study, work release, uh, community programs. I formed a very, very su successful partnership with GCC where we had juniors and seniors going up to GCC, taking classes and graduating um, with after two years at GCC with their high school diploma, in some cases with their associate's degree. So their creative thinking can make creative solutions. Well, thank you very much. I think it's time to move on to the uh, closing statements. And so we'll begin in reverse order from, from our opening statements with uh, David Narkowitz. I want to thank again the Ward 3 Neighborhood Association and, and you for your wonderful uh, moderating tonight. Um, I also want to say a special thank you to my wife, Yelena, who's working, and our daughters, Emma and Zoe, for their constant love and support. Northampton is an excellent place to live, to learn, to work, to run a business, and to raise a family. I'm running for mayor because I want to keep Northampton strong, and I want to make it better. During my three terms on the city council, I've been a positive and productive representative and leader. I've never shied away from tough issues or hard work. I've brought people together to create innovative solutions and tangible results to improve our community. Since announcing my candidacy, I've knocked on hundreds of doors and sat in dozens of kitchens and living rooms across our city, listening and sharing ideas and discussing my vision for creating economic opportunity and jobs, keeping our city livable and affordable, maintaining strong public schools, delivering smart, cost-effective city services, protecting our environment and keeping Northampton green and sustainable, fostering active neighborhood and citizen participation, and leading a government that is open, fair, and transparent. This election is a critical one for our city and presents a stark choice. There will always be real disagreements. The question is, how do we resolve them? Are we going to be stuck in the past, pointing fingers and dwelling on old fights and differences, or do we choose to look forward, talk about the future of our city, and decide how to work together to reach our shared goals. Northampton needs a mayor with a positive vision and a steady proven track record of leadership and results. A mayor who will unite our city and work hard every day for all of its people to find innovative solutions to the challenges that we face. I am the candidate with the experience, the ideas, the energy and commitment to offer a new generation of leadership to move our great city forward. Thank you all for coming tonight, and I hope I can earn your vote for mayor on November 8th. Um, I'm going to take a little bit of a risk of not finishing my closing statement by um, going back and responding to something that my opponent said, uh, uh, answering one of the questions. And he uh, took what I called a kind of a negative shot for the positive candidate here, took a negative shot in, in call, referring to my leadership as passive aggressive. And that is not what happened. That is an unfair characterization of what happened during uh, the city council at that time. The city council put the uh, decision of the uh, RFP with the Economic Development Committee, which I believe he served on at the time. So it wasn't that it was uh, uh, passive aggressive. We went through the appropriate process and the appropriate committees were involved. Uh, to the audience, thank you for taking the time to be here this evening. Voters are employers this year. You face the challenge of filling a position left vacant. I propose to you that I am the candidate with the strongest resume. First, I have 33 years as a professional educator in the public schools, a classroom teacher, guidance counselor, department head, and administrator. Second, I have over 20 years experience as a hardworking public servant in our city's government. Third, I have a proven record of leadership in a variety of circumstances. Eight years as a city council president, including several stints as acting mayor, a solid track record as an advocate for quality public education, human and civil rights, and also around uh, work, union issues for workers. I am the candidate who is best positioned to be the agent of change that we so desperately need in this city. I am the candidate with the heart, 
the soul and the courage to take on the challenge of being everybody's mayor, I ask for your vote on November 8th. We thank the candidates very much. Absolutely. Thank you very much for coming.